Northern Ireland, Wales, and Gibraltar. And it therefore struck us as kindly and apposite to have a discussion about what Brexit means for the future of the United Kingdom. I am one of those, as are almost all Liberal Democrats in the United Kingdom, who have believed that four nations coming together in the United Kingdom have achieved something greater than the sum of their individual parts, and that the United Kingdom as one of 28 countries coming together in the European Union, again, helped us to achieve something greater than the sum of our parts. But if the United Kingdom comes out of the European Union against the wishes of three of the constituent nations, then tensions are bound to be exacerbated. And it's for that reason that I'm delighted that we managed to secure today uh, the participation of Sheila Ritchie, Jane Dodds, and Stephen Parry uh, in this meeting to help talk us through uh, some of the challenges and perhaps some of the likely uh, outcomes. Sheila, um, I have known for many years, she <coughs> is the convener of the Scottish Liberal Democrats, which, despite her insistence, means she's the leader of the party. <laughs> we have a parliamentary leader uh, in the parliament at Holyrood, but Sheila actually runs the party and chairs the executive and so on. Sheila has been an active Liberal Democrat over many, many years. She has served on the European Economic and Social Committee, on which I serve until the end of this week. But more importantly, she has served as a member of the European Parliament since July of last year. And Sheila, we are delighted to have you here with the opportunity to hear uh, from you. I will introduce Jane and Stephen at the same time, uh, so as not to stop the flow of the meeting. <laughs> Jane is the leader of the Welsh Liberal Democrats. Uh, she uh, has been a member of Parliament for Brecon and Radnor in the United Kingdom uh, Parliament. Uh, and she is not only our leading personality in Wales, but also, of course, as you would expect, a fluent Welsh speaker somebody heavily engaged in the organizations of civil society uh, <coughs> in the Principality. <coughs> Stephen Farry is the deputy leader of the Alliance Party of Northern Ireland, uh, was, uh, an, or is a member of the Legislative Assembly uh, for <coughs> North Down, and was Minister for Employment and Learning in the Northern Ireland Executive until the post was abolished in 2016. We are delighted that the Stormont Parliament is back in operation and that Stephen and his colleagues can again uh, provide a strong Liberal Alliance Party voice in that forum. There are very interesting, very difficult challenges ahead for Northern Ireland because Boris Johnson has said that there will be a customs border down the Irish Sea, <coughs> which makes the debate salient than elsewhere over Brexit. So I would ask you, ladies and gentlemen, to welcome our three speakers. <laughs> and without further, further ado, in order of the size of their populations, I would ask <laughs> Sheila Ritchie to kick off for us. Uh, I'm very relieved that you didn't say in order of size, but that would probably also have been true. Um, I'm going to start with two apologies. Uh, Graham basically told me when I came in that I'd spoken too long at a uh, burnt supper on Friday night. <laughs> so I will do my best not to speak too long just now. I forgot to say, um, given my military background, I will enforce your <laughs> 10 minute time limit by using these cards. It will also help you. Yellow is one minute to go and red is time over. Um, my second apology is that Whilst you are a fr friendly audience, I realised when I was drafting this that it turned into a bit of an unbridled rant. I've bridled it back a bit, but it's still a rant. Um, Scotland voted to remain. I'm sure you knew that. Graham has just reinforced it. The vote was 63 to 38 in favour of remain. 
I would warn you, ladies and gentlemen, to be careful what you wish for. Think about it. How many nationalist parties in Europe do we praise? AFD, <coughs> Mega North, Golden Dawn? Ah, you see, but Scotland's not like that. We've got the lovely. The SNP is a cuddly party. Wrong. At their core, all forms of nationalism share the same two tenets. First, that members of the nation, understood as a group of equal citizens with a shared history and a future political destiny, should rule the state. And second, that they should do so in the interests of the nation. <coughs> there is an overlap between nationalism and racism. The SNP leadership may deny it, but have a look at the anti-English and anti-unionist rhetoric that the Cybernats use constantly. By the way, I don't excuse the Britnats who have led us to the path that we're in, but let's get real. Because one form of nationalism arguing it's better than another form of nationalism is the route to something seriously unpleasant. So what will happen? Well, frankly, who knows? I'm pretty clear that the SNP does not have today a mandate for Indie Ref 2. But we have Scottish Parliament elections next year, and it would be a churlish politician who did not recognise such a mandate if they get a majority then. Boris Johnson has, of course, said that he will not grant them consent for their independence referendum, even if they do get that majority. And all I can think of when I hear him say that is Catalonia. They may not get <coughs> the majority. In March this year, we will have the much-awaited criminal trial of the charismatic former SNP leader, Alex Salmond. He faces 14 charges, including one of attempted rape and 10 of sexual assault on 10 different women. The current leader is assailed on both sides, on the one hand for being too supportive of him and on the other for not being supportive enough. That schism reflects an internal divide between the independence now side of the SNP and the, well, we're not quite ready yet, wing. At the same time, the SNP government's statistics on delivering public services are tanking. Whether it's education, health or road building, we're getting worse. The government's answer? We're better than England. I don't want independence. I am an internationalist. I don't want a new border between Scotland and England any more than a new border between the UK and the EU. And at a very human level, I don't want Indy Ref too. The 2014 independence referendum engaged tens of thousands of people in politics for the first time. It also created <coughs> extreme social tension. Friends, families and strangers fell out. <coughs> the SNP saw it as a time of optimism. They discounted the lived experience of those of us who felt nothing but anxiety and discord, often accompanied by varying levels of violence. If there was a referendum tomorrow, they'd lose and we'd be stuck in a little Britain full of aging right-wing boors longing for empire and refighting World War II on a daily basis. If it's in two years' time, after a post-Brexit onslaught of austerity, who can say? I'm about to quote extensively from a report of social, equalities and uh, of social and equalities impact of Brexit, which was commissioned for the Scottish Government, carried out by Eve Hepburn of the University of Edinburgh. It is only published this month. How much more valuable had it been commissioned by the dilettante Cameron in 2016. The report examines 137 <coughs> potential social and equality impacts arising from Brexit. Some of these impacts will be shared across different groups of people. In particular, if the majority of economic forecasts are correct and the UK's economy suffers post-Brexit, the negative social <coughs> economic effects of the UK's withdrawal from the EU will impact across all equalities groups that are disproportionately represented in the low-income bracket. That category includes women, disabled people, older people, minority ethnic communities, people from a migrant background, people with caring responsibilities, care experienced young people, refugees, asylum seekers, offenders, ex-offenders, homeless people, gypsy and traveler communities, 
precarious workers and people with substance abuse issues. These groups are far more likely to rely on public services and benefits and have less disposable income and spending power. The socio-economic impact of Brexit across the policy group with regard to their access to public services, especially health and social care, their ability to buy daily essentials in the case of price rises, and their ability to access affordable housing are likely to be widespread and, according to economic al analysis, most likely to happen. In some cases, for those living in poverty or suffering job losses, the impact <coughs> will be very deeply felt. There are also likely to be legal impacts of Brexit across the policy group with regard to rights and protections they currently enjoy and which they may otherwise have enjoyed in the future had the UK not decided to leave the European Union. At a general level, all equality groups are likely to experience the loss of the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, which guarantees a freestanding right to non-discrimination and recourse to the rulings and case law of the European Court of Justice. This impact is likely to be widespread across all equality groups, and given that the UK government has made it clear that the Charter and the CJA <coughs> will have no jurisdiction in the UK after Brexit, it's most likely to happen. My friend and colleague, Lorelei Burke, now Baroness Burke of Solihull, asked in the House of Lords, what work has been done to see what happens when a number of these protective characteristics overlap? For example, in the case of a pregnant woman from a minority in a low-paid job. This is called intersectionality, <coughs> and we know that people affected suffer disproportionately. But it seems to have been confined to the too difficult box when it comes to measuring the effects of government legislation. That Scottish report sought to identify a broad range of potential impacts of Brexit. But some of these impacts are more likely to occur than others under different Brexit scenarios. When some imp impacts are likely to be certain, resulting from the clauses contained in the revised EU withdrawal agreement, and the UK's government, that it do government statements that it does not intend to stay affiliated to certain EU laws, funding and institutions. Other impacts, for example, the loss of protections and socio-economic impacts, are as yet unclear and will depend very much on negotiations between the UK and the EU in the coming months. As you may know, Scotland's national symbol is the unicorn. How many unicorns can the SNP promise in the worst case scenario predicted by the <coughs> My guess would be thousands. And whilst we should always remember that the greener grass on the other side of the, hill, of the hill may be astroturf, my political experience of the last 10 years teaches me that people will be go governed by optimistic promises, no matter how unlikely. I am reminded of the Scottish proverb, if wishes were horses, beggars would ride. If we are afflicted with independence, we will trip over our own feet in the rush to apply for admission. And if the last eight months has taught me nothing else, it's taught me how pragmatic this place is. Democracy and the rule of law? Tick. Human rights? Well, give or take anti-English racism and a scattering <laughs> of transphobia. Tick. Respect for and protection of minorities? See above and add in a sprinkling of, the Scots are racist, so we don't have to worry about that. The existence of a functioning market economy as well as the capacity to cope with competitive pressure and market forces within the union, oh dear. Never mind, they can improve. Tick. I have no doubt we'll be fast-tracked in if it happens. We'll have the old alliance to assuage Macron's fears, and there will be another herd of unicorns coming over the hill. <laughs> <coughs> Thank you, uh, Sheila. Uh, please allow me um, one follow-up question. Um, from a Brussels perspective, it often seems like in Scotland you have one camp of people who are pro-EU, pro-independence, and you have another camp that is anti-independence, uh, anti-EU, pro-leave. Um, so the position that you have described here is pretty much in between. It's a pro-EU, anti-independence position. Um, is there any politically fertile ground for such a position in, in Scotland. I, I don't want to 
and unfair with the microphone. So. If, if the choice were binary, as you describe it, then being a good liberal, we would of course be in the middle. Um, the, the reality is we will have left. I, I don't think we could win anything in, in a situation of going through the middle where the choice is bi binary. We will have left. <coughs> it has been <coughs> three and a half years of utter havoc to withdraw badly from the European Union, uh, a union of nearly 40 years. I think there are a great many people, uh, including many leavers, who believe that leaving the United Kingdom will be significantly worse. Um, I think we have to find a way of couching the debate so it is focused on the benefits of remaining within the United Kingdom. And frankly, this government is not helping that argument. Um, but we, we have to focus on the benefits because what was the expression that was coined in Scotland in 2014, project fear, uh, and which was used again extensively in the Remain Leave debate, uh, it is untenable as a way of keeping us in the United Kingdom. <coughs> we have to sell the union for people and not their, their, the dismantling of those unions. Right, uh, thank you, Sheila. Let's now turn to Jane. I hope I respect the order proposed by, by Graham here. Um, yeah, we're the smaller. <laughs> Jane, it seems that Wales is a very particular case. Um, Wales is the only nation represented here that has voted in favor of leave in the 2016 referendum with 52.5%, which is very close to the, to the number of people that voted for leave in England. At the same time, we see reports saying that the economic impact will be worse for Wales than for any other nation being part of the United Kingdom. So maybe you can explore a bit how does that match? How is that possible? Uh, what's, how is this mismatch possible? And uh, what do you wish for in the upcoming negotiations? I'm going to stand, if that's OK, partly <coughs> because I don't thrust myself on a stool like this. So um, firstly, thank you very much to the Friedrich Naumann Foundation, and thank you to Thomas and the team for, for organising this. Um, and for me, somebody from North Wales coming to this big Brussels, because it is huge in my view, is a real uh, experience and a privilege. Thank you very much. Diolch am Arian. Diolch am y cyfle dod yma heddiw, a diolch am y troes o hefyd dach ydi'r rhoi ni. So, um, they talk about people biting the hand uh, that comes to them, but in Wales, we actually bit off that hand uh, when we sadly voted out in the EU elections. Um, as Sebastian has said, um, we had the vote that said very clearly that Wales wanted out, and I, I sit here with my tin hat on, really, uh, in a mixture of nations who voted in. Let me just give you some thoughts as well. A place in Wales <coughs> called Ebu Vale uh, voted 62% out, and over five years, they have had 512 million pounds from the EU in terms of investment in jobs and in terms of infrastructure. In order to look, uh, for me, at what post-Brexit Wales will look like, we do need to look back a little bit. Uh, and we need to think, why did Wales vote out? I mean, I'll be frank, and I'll say, I have absolutely no idea. But I do think the campaigns that were run at the time were not brilliant, uh, and we didn't do enough to help people think about the effect it would have on their lives. But there are three or four other issues as well going on in Wales. There's the identity issue. Uh, we have a bigger border than Scotland does with England, um, and there is uh, a lot of analysis that's shown how people who are define themselves as Welsh only uh, and Welsh British voted in, and those who, who were English British, English Welsh voting out. There's also a lot of evidence showing that people who lived on the border of uh, Wales and England actually voted out and influenced that vote. 
So is identity actually the issue that we should be talking and thinking about? Migration is another one, another issue that people talk a lot about. And um, for somebody like myself who's worked with refugees and asylum seekers, who's been out to Calais, worked with separated refugee children, this is a really difficult area. Many people in Wales actually cited migration as being too high. Uh, and uh, yet we saw a city like Cardiff with the highest migration uh, actually voting in. But we know from evidence that actually Wales out of the four nations actually has uh, the, the, uh, a belief. 82% of the population believe in Wales that migration is too high. So should we be thinking about that? And another kind of peripheral issue is there's a newspaper in the UK called the Daily Mail. And actually in Wales we have the highest readership of the Daily Mail, a very, very pro-Brexit newspaper. So should we be banning the Daily Mail? <laughs> you can get my answer to that later. But I'd like to talk about four issues, four F. Um, which I think can help us think about a post-Brexit Wales. Firstly, finances. You know, the bottom line is that Wales gets more from the EU than any of the other four nation states. Uh, on average, £79 per head more than uh, England, Northern Ireland and Scotland. £680 million pounds annually has come into Wales from the EU. Uh, for a structural project and under cap. It's going to be a massive issue post-Brexit. Um, we have absolutely no idea where that money will come from. When I was in Parliament for that short period of time, many of us, including myself, asked constantly what economic impact had the government made of us leaving the EU? Where were their actual evidence, analysis, on our trade, on our manufacturing, on our economies. And nothing was forthcoming, and still nothing is forthcoming. In Wales, 229,000 people have gained qualifications through the EU, 72,000 people have got into work, 39,000 jobs have been created, 12,000 businesses have started through financial funding from the EU. Where is that going to come from post-Brexit? My second F is farming. Now, uh, in Brussels, I don't see m many green spaces, but where I live, uh, we're outnumbered by sheep. Um, it's, there are many figures. Uh, it could be 10 to 1, but it's certainly four, at least 4 to 1. Four sheep for every single human being. Farming and agriculture in Wales, just as perhaps in Scotland and in Northern Ireland, is a huge issue and was a huge debate <coughs> for us as well, particularly uh, that there could be a no-deal Brexit, which may still be on the cards. The Common Agricultural Policy gives to Wales uh, £350 million, pounds, supporting around 16,000 farms. Now, we get into a debate about whether farmers voted for Brexit or not. Um, and there is uh, anecdotal evidence that they did, but actually uh, the big farming unions were very anxious about leaving the EU and the effect on farming. 40% um, of Welsh lamb is exported, and of, that, of those exports, 92% come to the EU. Now, if you think about where that goes to forward-looking, if we don't get a deal and tariffs are imposed, Welsh farmers will potentially go out of business. There is no doubt. And let me tell you that up until February of last year, there was talk about culling healthy lambs in the markets, potentially ready for us leaving the EU at the end of October, which is the, the peak lambing time. And the Welsh government had started to make arrangements for those culls. That's how serious the whole thing is. So the third F for me, in terms of the effect on Wales post-Brexit, is about friends and friendship. I am bound to say that I think Wales is a friendly nation. We're a very internationalist nation. 
uh, where I was born in a place uh, outside a um, little village called Llangollen. We have Llangollen International Festival. Every year in July, 6,000 people come and perform from all over the world. <coughs> when I was a child, we would have people invade our house from the Turkish sword dancing groups and South African choirs and people from every single nation were coming to this very small place in North Wales to recognise internationalism. We've also benefited significantly from the Erasmus uh, programme. Uh, funding for that is absolutely uh, insecure and uh, we don't know what that will look like, but that has benefits, benefited our young people to the tune of around 30 million pounds. My fourth F, which is potentially an opportunity, is federalism. Because we now have an opportunity to think about federalism in a little bit more detail and what that looks like. Is this a model that we could be looking at uh, in Wales, post-Brexit? Is this something that we could start to actually grow and to have discussions around? I would be very interested in your views on that. But it's a model of redistributing power and wealth and resources from what we see in the UK, from the London and the South East, to places <coughs> where we feel we would benefit the most. So let me just finish by just saying, moving forward, our threats are from Plaid Cymru, the nationalist um, party, very similar to the SNP, um, where they are threatening for us to go independent, and we would absolutely be saying no to that. And the final thing I would say as well, we've got a potential party that will replace Brexit, ready for the Welsh Assembly elections next year. And that's abolished the Welsh Assembly party. So we're faced with this squeeze in terms of our, uh, our democratic system that says we want the Welsh Assembly to go, but we want further federalism and Devo maps uh, ahead of us. So I would be really interested in your views. As Welsh Liberals, <coughs> we're very clear that liberalism, actually in the UK, started in Wales, and we won't let it finish. Thank you, dear Colin. Um, thank you very much, Jim. Um, I totally agree, this chair is very uncomfortable. Uh, I, I disagree, Brussels is a very green city, although we don't have that many parts. Um, please allow me one follow-up question to you as well. Um, what outcome do you hope for now? If there is no successful conclusion of negotiations, the UK crashes out of uh, the current uh, alignment with the European Union, consequences are more severe, people might realize that you were right in the first place, uh, and there might be a chance for re-accession at some point in the future, or do you hope for a successful negotiation, close alignment to the EU, which will affect your four Fs less? Um, what do you hope for? Um, so, that's a really difficult question, isn't it, really? Um, I would not want anyone to suffer. Um, at all. I would not want us economically to be hampered. I would not want our um, democracy to be attacked in any way. Uh, my prediction, which, uh, which happens when we... Uh, well, actually, on October the 14th, uh, last year, I knew that we would be leaving the EU, which was when Boris Johnson got his deal. I don't know if you remember that day, Leo Varadkar, they had a kind of big ceremony, and I thought, that's it, the end is nigh. Uh, and at that point, I thought, my prediction is that we will crash out of the EU, and in May of next year, there will be a stirring in Parliament uh, to potentially uh, bring us to a place where there may be uh, a vote of no confidence. Um, but in May next year, we actually have our Assembly and executive, Scottish executive elections. Uh, and I'm very much hoping that we'll be able to put a marker down there. 
So I think that's the $60 million question. I would not want anyone to suffer at all, but um, I do sadly foresee a very difficult situation ahead. All right, um, let's then turn to uh, Steve. Um, and uh, afterwards, um, we will throw it open to you so uh, you can then ask your questions and, and comment. Um, Stephen, um, you represent the nation that we've probably talked most about in all those sure. Brexit discussions. Uh, you personally have been a member of the Northern Irish um, Assembly, which hasn't been sitting, and now that it has been reinstalled, you moved to Westminster, and one could say you've missed the show. Sure. Yep. But still, there's a lot to fight for, uh, so we would also be curious to learn what will you be fighting for, actually. Okay, um, Gordon Lockett, uh, thank you very much. Um, yes, um, Northern Ireland has been very much to the forefront of the, the Brexit process um, to date. Um, in some ways, Northern Ireland has held things up, maybe given other opportunities and chance uh, to be tested, which haven't um, particularly manifested themselves, unfortunately. Um, but also, um, Brexit poses um, some very particular challenges uh, to Northern Ireland, um, which are um, probably be very difficult to, to overcome. Um, at the outset, um, my, my starting point is that there's no such thing as a good or a sensible Brexit. All forms of Brexit are bad for the UK, obviously for, North, for Northern Ireland, but also bad for the European Union as well. I think everyone's going to lose as a consequence uh, of Brexit. Um, the ability of, of Europe to project its values around the world will be somewhat inhibited uh, by the dysfunctionality and disjoint that comes uh, from, from, from Brexit itself. On that, Graham, I haven't entirely given up hope on stopping Brexit, but th that's probably a very naive point, but if we lived in the movies, uh, on Friday morning, you see Boris Johnson bursting into the throne of the House of Commons and saying, I find it, the pennies drop, this is a bad idea, and calling it off, but um, unfortunately, I, I'm, I'm probably not uh, going to see that happen. But um, the, the problem for Northern Ireland is essentially this. We are sadly still a divided society in that we have a clash of different identities, and we're also a contested space, by, by which I mean that there is a, this debate whether Northern Ireland should be part of the United Ireland or remain part of a, a United Kingdom. And obviously the United <coughs> Ireland route has a certain added attraction now to some people in that it, there's an automatic route back into the, the, the European Union. It's not an option on the table for uh, others uh, elsewhere in, in the UK. The difficulty is that Northern Ireland is full of those um, contradictions and ambiguities. Um, and Brexit is essentially a nationalist populist endeavour which is offering simplistic black and white solutions in a situation that really needs different shades of grey to, to maintain itself. Northern Ireland only really works based upon sharing and interdependence. And that was the, the, the whole ethos behind the Good Friday Agreement where there was a very careful balance between the internal government of Northern Ireland uh, via the, the now restored assembly the north-south links on the island of Ireland and the east-west links inside uh, the United Kingdom, alongside human rights protections, equality protection, and that principle of consent that gives the people of Northern Ireland the right to decide which jurisdiction uh, they, they belong to. The problem is that Brexit um, entails some degree of a, a boundary, a border, and with that it brings a degree of friction. And wherever you draw that line on a map, will create some bureaucratic problems, but you also create a perception, an emotional, psychological perception of winners and losers. And in the context of a complex society like Northern Ireland, that is the bad news. And that's the, the, the essential challenge uh, that we're faced uh, with, with, with Brexit. The, the, the May deal that um, was at first negotiated was a much better attempt at a soft landing uh, for Northern Ireland. By contrast, the Johnson deal is a much more challenging uh, situation uh, for us. In the context that, where we start by saying that there is no such thing as a good Brexit, the May deal at least allowed us to uh, create a, a context where Northern Ireland could have a foot in, in both camps. We could have been that bridge between the UK and the, the wider European Union, and there may have been some potential economic opportunity for Northern Ireland in that particular regard. 
that was originally framed through the concept of the backstop, which sadly proved to be so toxic in, in Westminster. And you are right, Stefan, in some senses, I haven't just been elected to, to Parliament. I find myself arriving one term too late, um, because previously we had, uh, in essence, 10 uh, DUP MPs, uh, alongside seven Sinn Féin MPs, and my predecessor, Sylvia Herman, as, a, as an independent unionist, um, the only one taking a, a remain position. Northern Ireland voted um, quite considerably to vote uh, to stay in the European Union, but within unionism, um, majority voted to leave, and the DUP, <coughs> as in essence the, the main party in Westminster, was articulating a very, not just a, a, a leave voice, but actually a very hard leave voice, utterly at odds with the interests of Northern Ireland and indeed the long-term interests of the Union. Um, historians will look back and with bewilderment at the decisions that were taken by the DUP uh, over the past um, two, two or three years. But that deal, um, which would have been better for Northern Ireland, uh, was, was passed up and was ended up with, with, the, with the Johnson deal, which in essence potentially leaves Northern Ireland with the, with the worst of both worlds. The Johnson deal, um, in many respects, is still a fudge. It's a bit of a, a smoke and mirrors act, and some of the contradictions and tensions haven't been, I uh, believe, uh, resolved. The main manifestation is now going to be um, what I term as an interface down the Irish Sea. We're trying to avoid the term border, given the wider political connotations that flow, that flow from that. But that is going to create issues um, in terms particularly of trade flows from Great Britain in uh, to, to Northern Ireland. Um, and in essence, that will in, uh, entail both regulatory checks and a degree of customs checks on the movement of the goods. Um, that will disadvantage uh, our economy uh, in a large number <coughs> of respects. There's also the potential for problems moving from Northern Ireland into Great Britain. That's much more an issue for the UK as a whole um, to, to manage as opposed to, to, to the European Union. But even that is going to cause particular uh, difficulties. On that latter point, um, we have had the situation again, probably too late, where the Northern Ireland parties have come together around some common cause. Some people starting from a Remain perspective, others from a Leave perspective, as to how we can advocate uh, keeping that, that, that border as open as we possibly can. The wider um, GB to Northern Ireland issue is to, to be resolved over the next uh, 11 months in terms of the future relationship negotiations. And that will be heavily determined by uh, what happens uh, in terms of the scale of any free trade deal between the UK and the European Union. But, uh, but absolutely a free trade agreement, uh, even the most far-reaching one you can possibly imagine, is not the same as the customs union and the single market. And that will still involve some degree of checks um, down, down the Irish Sea. There's also an ambiguity as to what um, trade zone Northern Ireland belongs to in terms of our future um, agreements. Uh, because we, Northern Ireland, will remain in regular alignment with the European Union as pertains goods, we, we probably are covered uh, by European Union uh, trade agreements, albeit um, as a third country. Um, those trade agreements will be rolled over by the, the partners uh, of the, the European Union, which in itself is, is not a given. But in terms of services, um, we are more likely to be part of the wider UK um, framework. And that does create certain difficulties given the extent which goods and services uh, are often bound up together in, in, in any modern economy. We also lose out in terms of the free movement of people, uh, which again is vitally important um, to, to our economy. In essence, if we're in a situation where we're always having to explain our situation, our particular uh, relationship to the European Union and to the UK, then we're in a, a losing uh, <coughs> position. We'll just be in that we'll just be difficult box, uh, and the <coughs> investors will look elsewhere uh, to our neighbours. So rather than moving that, therefore from being that um, bridge between the European Union and, and the UK, we risk being uh, very peripheral and marginal uh, in that respect. There are also issues in terms of how you manage ongoing policing and security um, cooperation. Obviously, policing is a hugely sensitive issue uh, in Northern Ireland, and my um, party colleague, Emmy Long, MEP, for the next um, four days at least anyway, has just taken on the role of, uh, as Justice Minister uh, back in, in Northern Ireland. Um, again, uh, extradition and cooperation uh, between the, the police services. 
that's been vital in terms of the ongoing fight against the residual terrorist activity that still sadly happens uh, in, in, in Northern Ireland and also in the south of Ireland. Um, there's, there's also issues in terms of the whole rights uh, issue. People in Northern Ireland have a range of identities, um, British, Irish and, and a bit of both. Those people who have a, an Irish identity will automatically uh, have the full range of EU um, rights as EU citizens. Though some of those will only be applicable once they're actually inside the territory of the European Union. Those who have a British identity, and th these are perhaps people who live in the same street as you with, with, with an Irish identity, will have a lesser degree of rights protections. And that itself is going to create tensions in a society like Northern Ireland. So where we're going with this, um, I'm not entirely sure. Efforts have been made locally to restore the assembly. And ultimately, whatever way borders and lines and maps fall, the, the six counties that represent Northern Ireland have to work as a unit. We have to promote reconciliation, we have to build um, integration. Um, but the ongoing tensions that Brexit, Brexit has thrown up are going to be very destabilizing because for the best part of the past 20 years, Notwithstanding <coughs> all of the other clashes around identity, the constitutional questions has largely been parked. Brexit has now thrown that back uh, on the table. This has been the fault line through our politics for hundreds of years. The Good Friday Agreement was a sticky plaster that um, covered that, that fault line up. Um, that wound hasn't been properly healed over the past 20 years, and we should have not done better. But it's now once more exposed to the world, and where we go, I'm not sure. Perfect timing. Thank you, Stephen. Um, here in Brussels, we're often concerned about the preservation of the Good Friday Agreement. So now you've talked about different borders that will certainly arise or might potentially arise. So um, how do you see the prospect for peace and the preservation of peace in Northern Ireland in this situation? Well, I think in terms of peace, there's no immediate danger um, to the peace. I think the danger is more one of dysfunctionality and instability, uh, particularly as to what's going to happen in terms of Northern Ireland's um, status. I, mean, I think it's important to recognise that um, the European Union, uh, through Michel Barnier, had a very particular brief regarding Northern Ireland, but Northern Ireland is very much central to the, 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 the thinking of the European Union. But that in essence was about keeping open border on the island and protecting the Good Friday Agreement. The wider implications for the economy uh, weren't really part of the formal brief. And he said to us, look, if, if things work out well for you in terms of the deal, good luck to you, take advantage of it, but there's no guarantee. And that's probably the most immediate issue in terms of the, the economic consequences. But for sure, because the constitutional question has been reopened, that is now going to be an ever-present tension in, in our politics. And it does almost an indivisible um, win loss zero sum approach depending on which side of the community uh, you come from. Uh, we have the advantage of being a cross community party in that we're neither unionist or nationalist so we, we focus on trying to build integration within Northern Ireland but it, it, it will also create difficulty for us in terms of how we uh, draw in, uh, and articulate that uh, down the line and I think people are very uh, fluid in terms of some of their, their, their thinking as to where the future may lie. All right. Um, thank you very much. Um, so it's time to throw it open uh, to questions from you. We will collect a few. Please uh, say who you are, to whom your question goes, and please be brief. Please. Thank you very much for your briefing. My name is Thomas Migliadina. I'm uh, one of the correspondents of the Swiss Broadcasting Corporation. One specific Northern Irish question. Uh, could, how about you actually becoming the best place to settle if one wants to have both regulatory alignment with the uh, European Union and access to the, to the UK market? Could it actually be, uh, be a great thing for, for, for Northern Ireland, or, or am I just too um, optimist? And <coughs> for the uh, lady from, from uh, Wales, uh, how do you see the narrative um, the, the pro-Brexit narrative change now that Brexit is actually achieved? I mean, who are you going to blame for the problem now that it's no longer UK? All right, thank and you. it's no longer EU, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, we will collect a few more. Um, are there any at this point? Please, there's a microphone 
Thank you. I have two uh, separate questions. The first one, I thought... In uh, uh, please say who you are. Oh, sorry, right. I'm Nicolette Gevenke. I'm from I'm Netherlands, from Holland. Excuse me, I have a voice uh, problem. Um, I have two totally separate uh, questions. First of all, I thought on the program was Gibraltar. Uh, where is Gibraltar? Uh, and then the real question, <laughs> probably, is it to Mrs. Dodds, if I pronounce your name? Uh, well, you gave a very uh, detailed, very informative uh, speech, and of course that gives uh, possibilities to ask questions. Um, you said one of the advantages of the Europe being in, in the European Union is that you received a lot of subsidies per capita. Um, but that money comes from somewhere. It doesn't come from the European Union. It comes from the households in Western Europe and of the richer countries in Scandinavia and Western Europe. My country is the largest payer and, well, statistics, I don't know exactly, but it's about 500 euros per person we pay to the European Union. It's for households, 2,000 euros. Well, you can imagine that a lot of households would rather spend that for their parents, for their grandparents, for the education of their children. What do you are here? Is, is, is the, is the, uh, uh, makes it morally right that I should pay for people in Wales. I mean, you're not helpless people, you're a totally normal uh, West Europeans. You're not uh, that off, there's not a disaster, there's nothing going wrong there. Why should I pay for you? That's my question. All right, that's very good. All right, then uh, one more right there, the gentleman in the back. Sorry, I'm uh, Matthew Abad, I'm a trainee at the uh, European Parliament. I just got a question for uh, Mrs. Ritchie. Um, I know that in the moment in the uh, Scottish Labour Party, there's an internal debate going on about the party's position on Scottish independence for the 2021 holiday election. Um, I guess you've made your own views clear about Scottish independence, but do you think there's uh, any space whatsoever within the, Liber uh, the Liberal Democrats to soften their position on independence for 2021? All right, uh, thanks. We will start with those four. Um, you've rightly mentioned that Gibraltar was on the program, and unfortunately Gibraltar is not here today, which we very much regret. Um, a speaker from Gibraltar had to cancel on short notice for very understandable reasons, so I'm sorry for that. Um, so uh, this is why we have our three nation debate today. Uh, may we start with you, Jane? We have two questions concerning Wales. Thank you very much for this question. So firstly, who, who, I think the question was, who do you think the Welsh people will now blame? Uh, is that it? Yeah. Pro Brexit. Yeah, pro Brexit, yeah. Um, so I, I think this is the wider issue, isn't it? Which is about, um, and I think it was long, personally I think it was long before the referendum, we had a huge cohort of people who felt they had no seat at the table, who felt they had no aspirations no hope for the future um, and uh, we didn't do enough to reach out to them and to campaign on uh, and change uh, their lives so when it came to the eu elections there was this opportunity for them to blame the eu post brexit who will they blame well we've got this interesting situation haven't we in wales where we have the labor led welsh assembly and we have a conservative uh, government. And really, they are set to um, take chunks of flesh out of each other um, from, uh, well, from now, actually, because they're already starting to do it. As, as you will know, um, all of the um, devolved administrations have withdrawn their uh, legal agreement to the with Withdrawal Act, uh, and so the whole dialogue is starting. But actually, I'm not that, I'll, I'll be honest, I'll say I'm not that interested in what the, what the politicians think, because it's really what do people think this is going to do for their everyday lives, and what do people think in terms of who they are going to blame? Um, and I, I, I think that's, that's the issue. I, I think they will start to pivot to the Conservative government, uh, because Wales is not a, a, a country that is right-wing. 
that has voted for Conservatives, and we've seen that in terms of um, we've got a Welsh Labour administration which has been uh, responsible for the for Welsh Assembly for 20 years, uh, and I think they will start to blame the Conservative governments. Um, you could follow that up with why did we return Conservative MPs in the numbers that we did in Wales? Um, and um, we can have that discussion again, but was it Corbyn? Was it, uh, you know, get Brexit done as a phrase? I don't know, but I think it will, things will start to pivot towards bra blaming Johnson and the Conservatives. With regards to um, subsidies, uh, really good question. Uh, my colleague here very quickly drew up a chart though. Um, I'm afraid Netherlands is fourth or fifth in terms of being a net contributor to the, U to the EU. Germany is top, and the UK is second. Uh, so, yeah, but it doesn't matter. I mean, it's just yeah, but but the but the principle, the principle of the EU, which I think we all passionately believe in, is that it's about creating equity across all the nations. But that is for people who are in need. I mean, but why we got your people question, so please let's say continue. Sure. You or do so you we got your question. Sure. So the assessment made by the EU was that there were many places in Wales which actually dropped below the poverty level, and I would agree with that, particularly West Wales and South Wales, uh, places that had lost many of their industries. So their assessment, just as, as uh, you know, many other countries, many other regions in the EU are assessed as, as needing those subsidies is exactly the same. Um, but, but it's the principle, it's the values. For me, it's the values of the EU, which is about creating equity. Uh, and equalising our societies. We've, we've heard your question, uh, thank you for that, and no, you have received a response, and so now we will move on. I'm, I'm Sheila, you have heard, please, we've but discussed I'm this sure. issue, and you've heard the response. Yeah. Um, Sheila, um, we've had the question from the gentleman in the back on Scotland. Uh, I think the chance, we, we are carrying out the same sort of internal debate as the Labour Party uh, at the present moment. Um, two elements of that have already taken place. I see no enormous desire for the party to move towards anything that approaches gaining full independence. We've always been a federalist party. Um, I, th I think we will continue to espouse federal views. Um, and it's very interesting to see that Keir Starmer is beginning to fly kites on that subject as well. Um, the Labour Party has some distance to go in its electability in order to be able to help those of us with, with <coughs> federalist credentials make that a reality. We're an internationalist party and I don't think that we are likely to compromise our internationalist ideals at any point in the near future. Okay, and the, the potential opportunity for Northern Ireland to have the best of both worlds? Um, I think that was much more obvious with the Theresa May version of the deal than the Boris Johnson version of the deal. Um, the difficulty with the Johnson deal at present is that um, Northern Ireland maintains regulatory alignment with the European Union. Um, there's the potential for Great Britain then to diverge from that to a greater or lesser extent. But at the same time, Northern Ireland was part of the UK's customs territory. However, the, the European Customs Code is legally applied down the Irish Sea between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. So in essence, what is, should otherwise be a customs frontier between Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland on the island has been pushed back to the Irish Sea because it's not feasible to do it on, on land with, with um, 280 border crossings um, versus seven down the Irish Sea. That then creates the difficulty as to how you manage the movement of goods into Northern Ireland and how you differentiate between goods that are solely for Northern Ireland and those that are destined to move on into the European Union, um, particularly whenever um, many, many loads would be what you term a group edge, where they're mixed um, and or <coughs> sometimes some goods will go into Northern Ireland, have some added value and then move into the European Union. So it is incredibly complex, and our difficulty now is that complexity is a deterrent in terms of investment. If we're having to constantly explain how it works, 
and indeed to bear additional costs in terms of trying to make it work, it just becomes so difficult and complex that that, that becomes a deterrent. So a second round of questions from the floor. Um, please first you, and then Elise, and then the gentleman in the first row. Uh, hi there. Uh, my name is <coughs> Elise McKeith, and um, I'm a policy analyst at RBG Group. Uh, Jane Phillips, you mentioned that um, Wales is not really a conservative country, but I, I suppose this is a question for the whole panel. I mean, where does liberalism go from here? in terms of both the Lib Dems and the Alliance Party. Is the future bleak? Um, how, how do we go about fighting that? All right, thank you. So maybe that Ines doesn't have to walk that far, if that's fine for you. We start with you, and then we go back to you, Ines. Uh, or not. Um. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Mark Johnston. Um, clarification, I think principally to Stephen, but maybe to the others too. Um, as I understand it, frontier controls um, will apply at all Irish Sea ports. Um, so, for example, Tanra, Holyhead, and Brook, uh, just around, I think, uh, and at Dublin. And I think, just to expand on that, the busiest route for goods between GB and Northern Ireland <coughs> is the Holyhead to Dublin. Um, so just just to clarify that and, and what you, what each of you um, might see as the implications of that, could there be queuing at Holyhead, for example? All right, thank you. Uh, hi everybody, my name is Naomi Kapoor. Uh, I'm mindful that I just wanted to go back to Sheila's question of anti-English racism. Um, I'm mindful that we're a room of quite privileged white people. And so I wanted to ask the other two panelists, what do you think, is it fair to commit uh, anti-English sentiment with actual racism to the regime, which especially given how divided the UK is right now? And secondly, is it something that you're concerned about in England, or in Wales and Northern Ireland? If, if people are concerned of those of this regional national racism, all right. Uh, no, just about anti-English racism in particular, whether that's a thing, and uh, whether is that something that we should be discussing and saying I'm just mindful that we are white, predominantly white audience, but it's very privileged. All right. Okay. So maybe we start with this, and then we go to the potential cues at Irish and GB ports. Then we go to the response of liberalism, if you agree. So um, maybe you can respond, each of you, to all three questions. And we go from Sheila to Jane and then to Stephen. Um, OK, I'm going to duck. Uh, I definitely <coughs> think we have a problem with anti-English racism. I actually think we have a problem with racism. It's not an enormous problem by comparison with lots of other places. But that's mainly to do with the size of the minority ethnic population that we have in Scotland, which is not huge. And we're a big country, and it's quite easy to, for, for people to integrate without looking as though they're living in minority ethnic, uh, I'm going to use the word ghetto, but I don't really mean it, just a whole community. Um, that's a problem for I I integration if you're trying to work actively, because it's very difficult to access the community, except through Facebook. And I have done quite a lot of work on this in the last few years. Um, I, I'm not talking places about it, and I fear that one of the problems that we have about racism in Scotland is that it's, it's enormously complacent. We're all nice people, we don't have a problem with coloured people. It's just a, sh a shocking approach to what is actually still a pretty real problem. Um, Northern Ireland has very carefully exported some of its little difficulties into particularly West Central Scotland. Um, I think it has been said that we are pretty much the only country in the world where our football support depends on whether or not we are Catholics or Protestants. Um, in West Central Scotland in particular, but it also applies in Dundee and in Edinburgh to a, a lesser extent. Um, a thing I had not 
spotted until late in the 2014 election campaign was the divide in Glasgow, which was following Republican and Unionist lines. Um, basically, the Catholic community got sucked into the Republican um, camp and therefore the, the independence pizza camp. And the, I, I think, fairly ghastly pro union flag waving Protestant ghastly things. Um, I, I'm not confident, it's nothing to do with their religion, it's the way that they behave culturally. Um, where on the other side, and immediately after the referendum, there were flag waving um, triumphalist uh, um, demonstrations in Dodge Square in Glasgow. Uh, immediately followed by attacks, physical attacks from the Catholic community, and that's uh, and, and actually, you know, I'm going to say Catholic community, but actually it's a cultural thing. It's really not a religious thing, but it, it's horrible, and it has, and we did not see it in anything like that strength um, before the 2014 um, campaign. That has spilled over into anti-Englishness. I was quite pleased about the Olympic Games, which we had in London, because it rehabilitated the use of the Union flag in Scotland. Um, that's completely gone again, because it's been nicked by the Brexiteers. Um, and flag waving is just some, simply not something that we, do, we think should be doing. And, and I'm very, very clear that there is anti-English racism in Scotland. On the somewhat more difficult question about where now for liberalism, um, we are working on it. Um, I mean, clearly it is a work in progress. I have been engaged in two serious strategy meetings since the turn of the year on the subject, and that's at moving out across the party in Scotland. Um, I think we are going to see a bonfire of our rights the rights that we have built and fought for over the last 40 to 50 years in the United Kingdom. And I think that Johnson's populism will set out to destroy them. Um, and I think that there is, as a consequence of that, no greater need for liberalism. Um, that it, there has been no greater need for liberalism in the last 50 years than there is today. Um, we have built a very, very strong pro-EU movement in Britain. It's bizarre that we're losing and we have the biggest active pro-EU movement in Europe, um, which is what happens when you're faced with a threat. I'd like to think that we will retain uh, the, 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 those people. Um, and I think that we have to stick to our principles. I think we have to be local in our application of government and not blink in, in, in the face of populism. And on the um, potential for... I have no um, idea. No idea. All right. Maybe Jane can... Why I didn't answer. <laughs> That's all right. Um, maybe Jane can align us uh, on, on that, but also on the, the two other questions. So anti-English racism, definitely, and uh, in Wales, you know, there's been many, many experiences, sadly. You know, we had a uh, Plaid Cymru candidate, actually, in, a, in Ceredigion, in West Wales, actually uh, deselected because uh, he was uh, engaged in very anti-English rhetoric. Uh, and, you know, I, we all have to check ourselves, I think. There is, uh, you know... <laughs> We, we have to always be aware of that uh, anti-English feeling um, and we have to just take a step back and just think about that because it absolutely to me fits into racism. So it is so important we're self-aware of that. Um, where, Blaise, you asked about where next for, uh, for liberalism, uh, specifically talking about you know Wales not being a conservative nation. Um, I, I actually think we need to take a look at progressive alliances. We know that when the Labour Party does well, the Liberal Democrats do well, liberalism does well. Uh, we know that uh, one thing we're very clear about is that we have a huge cohort of people who don't want the conservative values as they are. And that I think that will become more and more the case. So we just have to be open to thinking, are we there? 
to work with other parties. So liberalism is absolutely not always about us being in power or having seats, because I think there are lots of liberal uh, <coughs> principles and ideas that have infiltrated our society without us even <coughs> saying they're liberal, or that was because of a liberal MP or a liberal uh, MSP or a liberal uh, AM or whatever. I think we've, we've, in terms of our liberal values, we've actually uh, embedded much in our society already, and we continue to do that. So. Um, that would be my response to that. And was there something else that I might be interested in? A potential for disturbance of, of traffic across the Irish Sea. Oh gosh, yes. Okay. In Holyhead, yes. Well, those of you who've been to Holyhead um, will see what a rundown area it is. It is shockingly deprived. And I'm going to come back to what this lady said. I really hope that the Netherlands doesn't suffer financially or have areas of deprivation because that's what we've got in Wales. And that's why we have this equaling out of, of support uh, across our, our European Union. But n Holyhead is a very deprived area. And if you go there, as I have done, uh, you, and talk with people about what they anticipate, um, they think it's all myth, that there will be queues, they think everything will be fine. But the reality is that the evidence says there will be lorry parks, and they're preparing for those. Um, there will be more checks. Um, one, one anxious area is about um, whether, you know, the kind of alliance, uh, uh, the um, rules around checks on animals coming in, etc. That's one area of concern. Um, and, and many vets that you talk to who work and live in that area are very, very concerned that that will not be as well policed. Um, so yes, I think there will be queues, and that's my prediction, that May next year people will start to see this is actually isn't working. All right, thank you, Jenny. And uh, you. just to pick up on the, the border point first, um, in essence, your analysis is, is, is correct. Um, legally, the border between Great Britain and the Republic of Ireland and between um, the Great Britain and Northern Ireland will be different concepts, but the net effect may be fairly similar in terms of the, the checks that do need to take place in, in, in that regard. On the issue of I just want to briefly touch upon Jane's point around funding and the, the um, one added um, thing I think worth noting is that whenever funds are distributed within, within the UK, they're based upon population through what's called the Barnett formula. Whenever we look to European funds, they're allocated based upon need, so much more need focus. So Wales, North Ireland, Scotland tend to do better than we would do in terms of what would come from London. That's going to be a very active debate over the next 12 months as we look to the future of European funding or the replacement in that regard. In terms of the English racism, I think Northern Ireland is in a slightly different context in that um, Great Britain and the British identity has been transposed into Northern Ireland and as part of that clash of identities between uh, the British Protestant Unionist identity, Catholic Irish nationalist, though I have to say those are very simplistic concepts, there's a lot of shades in between, but nonetheless, um, English is, is wrapped up inside that, that, that wider that wider on, envelope. Um, on the, the future, cha the challenge for liberalism, um, I don't have an immediate answer here, but I do think, maybe just to, even to widen the question out, to me, I think there, there are two fundamental aspects of, of liberalism which hopefully unite virtually all of us in, in the room. The first one is that it's all about the, the, the rights and the opportunities of the individual. And the second is about international cooperation around our, our shared problems and a rules-based international system. We're seeing challenges to those coming from what you could frame as nationalism and, and populism. So there is a need for um, liberalism to fashion a response to that. This is not a particular challenge to us um, in the context of the UK. Brexit is what one manifestation of that problem. It may well be a very particular or extreme manifestation, but it is a common problem throughout the, the, the European Union and beyond. And we all have that shared challenge as to how we push back against that. And I know work has been it's ongoing in many uh, countries in that particular regard. There's also a need, I think, for liberalism to reinvent itself around how it deals with climate change. I don't think intellectually that has been fully married uh, to date. I think that's going to be a, a very immediate challenge over the next number of years as well. So I think liberalism goes through this um, reinvent, reinvention of itself every 
100 years or, or, or 50 years, I think we're in that phase. We talk about what needs to be the subject of a much wider dialogue, and I'm happy to be read books uh, in step into the future. <laughs> 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 have another event along those lines. All right, uh, thanks to all three of you. Um, it's now slowly time to wrap up. I know some of you need to go back to their desks. So um, I would ask uh, Sheila to complete this sentence. The sentence goes, in 10 years time, Scotland will be. <laughs> when as usual, beautiful, as usual. I honestly don't know. I, I think there are two answers. We will be part of a resurgent United Kingdom, I hope, applying for, re for admission to the, United, uh, to the European Union. Um, the alternative is that we are independent, poorer, and already uh, members of the European Union, and probably in that context, net recipient of the Convergence Fund. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. In 10 years' time, Northern Ireland will be... Can I do that one? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure, please, please. That's, what, that's what I've been doing. That was much easier. Um, uh, oh, that, that is particularly difficult. Um, we, we are going through what is a very fluid situation um, because the, the wider constitutional question has been reopened and I think there is a, an inevitability of some degree of change on the island. Where exactly that end up, I'm not sure, but it does need to be a very managed um, process and in all of that we have to ensure that there is a degree of coherence and integration within what is currently uh, Northern Ireland. I suspect that Northern Ireland will still be part of the UK in, in, in 10 years' time, but that debate will be continuing and that will be more advanced. And exactly what, what happens in terms of the European Union and Northern Ireland's place in that regard, in terms of that, of that future relationship, will be a key determinant of whether that actually forms. Thank you, Stephen. Jane, I think you uh, have an idea where this is going. <laughs> okay, well, in 10 years' time, when I go back to my four Fs, in 10 years' time, Wales will have the finances it needs to thrive. Wales will have uh, its farmers looked after. Wales will be looking at a federalist model. But most importantly to me, Wales will still be having the friends it needs, both in the UK and in the EU. Thank you, Jane. I think we all very much like this, this third F you, you proposed. <laughs> so, um, Thanks a lot. Uh, this was, I guess, a very interesting multi-perspective uh, debate uh, from an angle that is not very usual here in Brussels because we hear so often from London, but not necessarily from Belfast, from uh, Edinburgh and from Cardiff. Uh, Sheila, thank you so much for having spent your third last day in the European Parliament here with us. <laughs> Stephen, thank you for making all the way from London. And Jane, thank you for making all the way from Wales. Um, and thank you for spending this lunchtime debate with us, and I hope to see you again soon. Thank you.